The first, les- the first lesson for this special worship service this morning is taken from the book of Daniel, chapter 10, beginning at verse 10. <clears throat> A hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, consider carefully the words I am about to speak to you, and stand up, for I have now been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up trembling. Then he continued, Do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before God, before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me twenty-one days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future, for the vision concerns a time yet to come. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. This is the word of the Lord. The second lesson for this morning is taken from the book of Revelation, chapter 12, beginning at verse 7 through 12. This will serve as our sermon text. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation, and the power, and the kingdom of our God, and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night, has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel is recorded in the book of Luke, chapter 10, beginning at verse 17. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. This is the gospel of the Lord. Grace and mercy and peace are yours from God, our Heavenly Father, through his Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The text, again, for our consideration on the special Sunday that we don't, as a matter of fact, I look back, and as far as I can remember, we've only done this once because the last time that a Sunday fell on September 29th, it was 2013, six years ago, But it's a good, and it gives us a good opportunity to celebrate the the things that we call angels. A number of years ago, there was a a renewed interest in angels, and you saw it on TV and television shows and movies. But there's a lot of people in this world who don't understand, who don't sometimes even believe that there is anything but what we see with our own eyes. I bet you some of you, however, could tell me stories about guardian angels. And I would not discount them one bit because I've got my own stories about guardian angels, those messengers that God sends to guard us and keep us. We're not going to sp- focus just so much just on those guardian angels, but the fact that there is angel and there is demon. There is a big war going on, not just in heaven once upon a time, but still for our souls, and that is the focus for our our worship this morning. Dear brothers and dear sisters in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, then war broke out. Did you hear that in the first verse of our text for this morning? 
Then war broke out. Now that phrase should not surprise us because war has been breaking out for years. <clears throat> Since the Old Testament, read through the pages of the Old Testament and you will find countless people going against, fighting against, warring against countless other people. And it's been going on ever since sinful people brought sin into this world or good people brought sin into this world. In our small nation's history, <clears throat> actually not such a small nation, but in our small history, timeline goes, because, what are we, 250 about years old? That that pales in comparison to some of the older countries in, in the old country who lasted many, many years. But just in our short span of about 250 years of existence in the United States of America, how many wars have we fought? Any history, history buffs out there? Go back to the Revolutionary War. That's the one that started it all out. You've got all the Indian Wars, the French and the Indian Wars that were fought on our soil. You've got the Spanish-American War, the Mexican-American War. You've got, what else? World War One, the war to end all wars, which was followed by World War Two, which was another war to end all wars, which was followed by Korea and Vietnam and the Gulf War, Iraq, Afghanistan, the war against terrorism that we're still fighting today. And I bet you I've missed a number of them in which people from our country have fought in. Our country has been at war for many, many years of its existence. Jesus tells us as much. Jesus tells us that in the last days you can expect there to be wars and rumors of wars. So don't ever expect that wars are going to go away and there's going to be peace in this country or peace in this world until he comes back again someday. What we don't expect, however, is from the end of that first sentence of our text. War broke out, but where did the war break out? It broke out in heaven which is the last place that anybody would expect war to be going on. Then war broke out in heaven. When, when people read those verses or those words, then a dozen other questions pop up in our minds, like, well, what was the war about? And when did that war take place? And who was the war between? And how did good angels turn bad angels? Why is there one called the devil or Satan? And how did he get angels, good angels, to follow him? All these questions pop into our minds. And you know something? We can't answer them all as well as we would like. We can speculate sometimes, because, but the Bible doesn't give us good, accurate, solid answers for all of those questions. What we do know is that it happened. Because the Bible tells us, then war broke out in, in heaven. And, and we see the results of that coming down to us thousands of years later. What we also know is that the devil was defeated. And so <clears throat> the war has been won, but if you read and paid attention to the last couple of verses in our text, the devil is furious that he lost and was cast out of heaven. And because the devil is furious, he is on a rampage, and he is going to do anything in his power to bring more people to spend eternity with him in hell. The war has been won, but the battle still rages on. Here's what we know about those spiritual beings that we call angels. <clears throat> Sometime during those six days of creation, we don't know exactly when it was, God must have created these spirit beings. They're called angels, which is, is defined as being someone who is a messenger. Angelus, the word angel, means messenger. And we see that happening in God's word. Very often in the Old and New Testaments, God sent angels from heaven down to earth to give a message to one or another of God's people. Over and over we hear courses and cases like that. They are, in essence, ministering spirits sent to serve the Lord. Sometimes they protect God's people. That's where we get the idea of guardian angels. Sometimes they send the messages like, like, like Gabriel said to Joseph, saying, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Lord God. 
so they do serve as messengers. Sometimes we are told that they carry the souls of believers even to heaven. So they're very useful creatures, spirit beings. We don't know, however, too much more about them. Evidently, somewhere, sometime, not long after they were created, after the sixth day, there was a, a, a problem in heaven. And one particular angel, which was then called the devil or Satan, he gathered a bunch of other angels, good angels, and they fought against Michael, the leader of the good angels. The, the devil and his followers, they fought against Michael and his followers. That's what John describes in the first verse of our text. Then there was war in heaven. If you're a movie buff or if you're a book lover, think Lord of the Rings. It's kind of an old movie now. But if you want to talk about something that really gives you a picture of good versus evil, God versus the devil, <clears throat> and the, the, the intensity of the war that was raging, think of that particular trilogy, The Lord of the Rings. If you haven't seen it, see it, because it gives us... It was written by a Christian author to try to give us a kind of a picture of what happened in heaven once upon a time in our text. We, we, we do know the outcome, however. John tells us in verse 8, but he, that is Satan, was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. That is, he and the evil angels that followed him. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Peter fills in some blanks when he says in Second Peter chapter 2, verse 4, God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them into gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment forever. The devil and his evil angels that followed him lost the war, but they are definitely not done fighting. Again, did you catch the last couple of verses of our text? <clears throat> It tells us, but woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has been cast down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. And so what is the devil going to be doing for the length and the balance of his existence until Christ comes again? He's going to be fighting for people's souls. He's going to be fighting for your souls not going to be fighting for the unbeliever souls. He has them already. He's going to be fighting for our souls. And he's going to throw everything that he possibly can in his arsenal against God and us. Now we can learn a little bit more about the devil and what he is like by the names that John gives us in our text here. First he calls him that great dragon. This is not some cupcake opponent very, very often I wonder at the beginning of the year in college football, how in the world does a Division I program like Wisconsin or, or Michigan or Ohio State play some tiny little Division Three school and they beat them like 77 to nothing? How do they schedule that? I know that they need practice and I know that they need those kinds of scrimmage games, but, but it doesn't seem right. This is not the devil. The devil is not some cupcake. If, if the devil was, was some kind of an opponent that you wouldn't have to worry about, then John would have been inspired to call him a, a kitten. The great kitten was thrown down. A dragon is different than a kitten or a kitty cat. And that's to tens, intensify what we think of when we think of the devil. Goes on. He says, That ancient serpent who leads the whole world astray. If he's an ancient serpent, that means he's been doing what he has been doing for a long, long time. And what has he been doing? He's been trying to tempt the world into sin. When you've been doing something for a long time, doesn't that kind of mean that you're getting pretty good at it? I see sometimes service trucks or service vans driving or down the highway, and they'll say, whatever the name of the family's company is, and it, it'll say, in service since 1949. And, and why do they put that on the sides of their trucks? Because they want you to understand that if they've been in service since 1949, 
They're good at what they do. We've been serving your electrical needs, your plumbing needs since 1949. That should tell me that if they've been around that long, they're pretty good and they should be good at what they do. And that's exactly what the devil is. I'll bet you that you have some experience with it. I bet you you know friends or family members who have been attacked by the devil and who has been successful in taking them away from the family of God. He leads the whole world astray, starting with Adam and Eve. And remember, th those were perfect people. If, if the devil can lead perfect people into temptation, what do you think he can do with less than perfect people like you and me? That's why God tells us over and over in Scripture, be on your guard. He's like a prowling lion looking for whom he may devour. John goes on, he calls him the devil, which means liar, and then he calls him Satan, which means accuser. So, so this is how those kinds of things work. The devil works as a liar. That's what the word devil means. How does he lie to us? Very much like he lied to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. You could be like God. Do you realize that? You could be just like God if you ate from this tree that God told you not to eat from. The reason that he told you not to eat from that tree is because you would become like God. You would become his equals. And Eve and Adam said, you know something? That sounds like a good idea. I would like to be like God. The devil lied to them, just like he lies to us still today. God says in his word, <clears throat> Do this or don't do that. And then the devil comes and whispers in our ear, did God really say that? Did he really say that this, it was, this consequence is going to come from that particular action? The devil is good at what he does. But, but then combine the liar aspect of the devil with the accusing aspect of the devil because that's what the word Satan means. It means the accuser. When we fall into sin, then the devil turns around and says, see what you did? Do you understand what you did? Do you understand how egregious of a sin that was? You're going to pay for that particular sin. And he even goes in front of God himself and he says, God, what did you say about sin? The wages of sin is death, right? I've got sins on this person and this person and this person. So what happens now? They deserve death in hell. The soul that sins is the soul that ought to die. That's what the devil does. He lies to us. He gets us to fall into temptation. Then he accuses us and tells God that this is what they did. Now they deserve eternal punishment in hell. But then <clears throat> the devil is not thinking about one little thing. Because the next verses of our text say this, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of who? Of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers, that's the devil, who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Those words remind us that when we faced our greatest enemy, the devil, God used his most powerful weapon to fight against our greatest enemy. Martin Luther described him when he wrote that great Reformation hymn. In this verse, he says, But for us fights the valiant one, whom God himself elected. You ask, who is this? Jesus Christ it is, the Almighty Lord. There is no other God. He holds the field forever. He is the last one standing on that battlefield. When everything is said and done, he holds that field forever. Jesus used his blood to pay for our sins 100%. And everything that causes us guilt and pain and thoughts of punishment forever, Jesus forgave those sins. And so when the devil comes before God and says, do you see what they just did? Did you see what I just tempted them to do? They deserve to go to hell. You can't lie. The wages of sin is death. What does God say? What is his response to the devil? Their sins have been paid for by the blood of the Lamb, the Savior Jesus Christ himself. And so he says, what sins have they committed? I don't see any sins on their record. Jesus Christ has obliterated those sins, 
and they will not have to pay for them because Jesus already did. Jesus used his life to pay for those sins. We don't have to worry about it. What we do have to be concerned about, however, is that the fact the devil is going to continue to come after us over and over and over. As I was doing some, some studying for this text, I was kind of looking for the background of, of this festival that a lot of churches use on this particular September 29th. The, the festival of St. Michael and all angels. I, I found out that there is some reason behind why they chose this time of the year to have this particular festival. What are you noticing more and more when you get up in the morning these days? Maybe even as you came to church this morning or when you're trying to get a job done at 6 o'clock at night these days. The days are getting shorter and the nights are getting longer. I'm not sure exactly when daylight savings time is coming so that we have a little bit more light, or it seems like we have a little bit more light, but the days are really getting shorter, and the nights are truly getting longer. It's on this time that the early Christians, back 1,500 years ago, said, you know something? When we have this time of, of equal light and equal dark, it kind of reminds us of the battle between good and evil that is going on in this world. The battle between good and, 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 and evil and light and dark, between Jesus himself and Satan. And they said, let's take some time around this particular equinox in the year to remind ourselves that God has given us angels as our protectors and as our guide as our guardians. Let's take this time of the year to remind us of the fact that we have the angel armies of God on our side fighting against the demonic forces of the devil. Also remember that once upon a time, Jesus won the war on Good Friday and the devil lost once and for all. May we always remind ourselves and remember that the spiritual war for our souls, it's real. And again, I, I don't have to tell you stories of that. People fall away all the time. I could tell you stories, long stories, many stories about faithful Christians who don't even bother to step inside of a church any longer. The spiritual war for our souls is real. But at the same time, our protection ultimately comes in God's angels and better yet, the Lamb of God. The, the blood of our Savior who has won the victory. The war has been won. Yes, the devil is still fighting, but remember, the war has been won. Amen. The peace of God which goes beyond our understanding will guard and keep your hearts and your minds in the true faith. In Christ Jesus, amen.